good hold on good. <laughs> good evening everybody how you doing i hope that you're doing well hope you're having a great beginning of the week it's good to see uh sister shelva and sherry glad that you're with us this fine uh fine evening uh, tonight we are going to be looking at some just glorious glorious verses from colossians chapter 3 so i am so glad that you have joined us because i think i believe that these verses are well worth our time today. Um, you know, we've been talking about how one of the things I mentioned a couple days ago was how Colossians, in Colossians 3, Paul, he talks about taking off certain things and then he talks about putting on certain things. And we talked about um, even how that may be related to baptism in the first century. Uh, and so we talked yesterday, if you were here with us uh, la uh, last night, we talked about taking off uh, a number of things. And this is what he does in Colossians 3, uh, what is it, uh, 5 through 11 or 6 through 11 or something? Well, tonight we're going to talk about what we're supposed to put on. And this is where it gets really, really good. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm glad that you are with us. And it looks like we've got a handful of people. Please throw a comment on our chat box and uh, we'll say hello. Looks like Helena is on, so we want to say hi to her. Um, or Helena, um, we uh, please leave a comment. Please like uh, like our video, uh, share it, get, let it get out there, and um, we are going to dig right into Colossians chapter three. So if you'd like to join me, you can read along. We're going to start with verse twelve. Like I said, uh, if you haven't been with us, basically what Paul has done earlier in this chapter is talk about how we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. We have been raised to newness of life with Christ. Um, and as a result, we are to put off certain things. And this is what we talked about yesterday, um, that we're to put off these sexual sins, disordered desire is the way we might put it. And we're also to put off sins that are born out of anger, things like anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, um, things that way, the ways that we interact with people in negative ways. But that's not enough. See, it's not just enough to quit sinning. And I know that for for many people, um, that's almost that seems like the goal is as long as we quit sinning, we stop doing bad stuff, we're good. That's not really what God wants. What God wants is that for us to do a complete 180. He doesn't want us to just stop going down the wrong path. He actually wants us to turn around and start going down the right path. And for too many of us, we just you know get to the point where we're and especially you know as preachers. Um, maybe we get in the habit of talking about stopping going down the wrong path, but we never get around to talking about what the right path is. And, and here's what I've found, is that when we start going down the right path, when we start following um, what God wants for us, then we don't have to worry about not doing because we are just doing. Um, so that's I, that's why I'm really excited about tonight, because tonight, oh man, oh man, if you're tuning in tonight, you are tuning in for probably some of the best verses in the whole book of Colossians. Um, we will, uh, Sister Charlotte, we'll continue to remember Anna. And it looks like Sharon's on, and Helena, I've got your name pronounced right the first time. Well, then I'll continue to pronounce it right. So let's read verses 12 through verses 17. These are so good. So good. Listen to what Paul says. So... As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I'll be honest with you. I think that as a Christian, if you just had verses 12 through 15, uh, 17 of Colossians chapter 3, you would have a lifetime's worth of pursuit in front of you. Um, because what Paul does in these handful of verses is paint us a beautiful picture 
of the Christian life and of what we should look like. He doesn't just tell us what we shouldn't look like. That's what he did in the previous verses. Now he tells us what we should look like. So let us sort of break it down uh, into its pieces. And it's going to require me, let me see, to... Your screen may look funny for a minute, so I apologize. We are going to get it fixed. Okay, so let's let's go through this a verse at a time. Like I said, if you got any questions or any thoughts, just throw them in the comments, and we will discuss whatever it is. So we begin with this word "so," which is an important word. I've, we've talked about it before. It's just, it, this is a a word like the word "therefore." In fact, usually, very often, this word is translated "therefore," which is important because it tells us with there, there's a, there's a cause and effect relationship because of one thing therefore something else so what's the cause as those who have been chosen of God holy and beloved Paul begins by recognizing our state who we are where we stand once we understand who we are and whose we are and where we're standing, our position, it's a lot easier to figure out where we're going and what we're supposed to be doing. Think about it. If you got a job, um, wouldn't you want a job description? You know, job descriptions are a beautiful thing. If you've ever had a job and you had no job description, man, that can leave you wondering, well, what am I supposed to do? What am I responsible for? What am I not supposed to do? And it can sort of leave you flailing a little bit. Whereas if somebody comes to you and says, look, here's your position. This is where you're at and this is what's required of you and this is what your responsibility is. There's, there's a sense of, of comfort and peace of mind that comes with knowing sort of where we stand. Um, and this is where Paul begins as he lets us know where we stand. Who are we? Well, he says that we've, we've been chosen. We're chosen of God. And not just chosen, but we're chosen by God. So it's important that we recognize God chose us, that we are holy, and that we are beloved or beloved. Um, these are really significant words right here. Chosen, holy, and beloved. Why? Well, if you read your whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, what you'll find is that these three words are not just used of you and of me. Originally, they were used of the nation of Israel. Israel was called God's chosen people, right? We all know this. Israel was called a holy nation. And Israel was called beloved of God, um, the apple of his eye. If I'm not mistaken, uh, whenever the scripture uses that phrase, the apple of his eye in the King James, it is referencing Israel. Although don't quote me on that or don't hold me to that. I, I just, that came to me right now. So I'm, I think that's what it was, but that I could be wrong. But regardless, Israel is called beloved in the Old Testament. So here we have God's people being called all of these things in the Old Testament. Israel was chosen. Israel was holy. Israel was beloved. The problem was Israel also failed big time again and again and again. And Israel went into idolatry. Israel sinned. Israel had major issues. And as a result, um, well, maybe not as a result. God had planned on it anyway. Uh, but God sends Jesus. And Jesus becomes what Israel was supposed to be. This is why when we read the Gospels, we read that this all of these similarities, these parallels between Israel and Jesus. This is why, for example, um, Jesus goes down into Egypt, right? You know the story from, uh, what is it, from Matthew's Gospel? Uh, I think it was Matthew's Gospel. Uh, where Jesus, you know, uh, Herod is going to kill all the babies. And so Jesus and Mary and Joseph, they go down into Egypt and then they come back. And, and what does it say? It says that this takes place to fulfill what was written in the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Originally, that was referring to Israel. But the fact is, Israel was a failure. And so Jesus did, kind of his life followed the same pattern of Israel. Jesus was the true Israel of God. And so this is why not only does Jesus go down into Egypt, just like Israel did, and then was called out of Egypt, just like Israel was, but Jesus also spends 40 days where? In the wilderness. Well, what did Israel do? They spent 40 years in the wilderness. They were tempted in the wilderness. Well, Jesus too was tempted in the wilderness, but the difference is where Israel failed their temptation, Jesus succeeded in his temptation. Jesus was the perfect fulfillment 
of what Israel was supposed to be. And because of this, Jesus receives these same titles, chosen, holy, and beloved. Let me show you what I mean. If we come over here, we can look at a handful of examples of this. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 4, we see Jesus described this way. That we are coming, he says, we are coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice or a chosen stone. Referring to whom? To Jesus. Jesus is the chosen one of God. There it is right there. So Jesus is the chosen one. Not only is Jesus the chosen one, but we also see the word holy used to describe Jesus. Over here in John chapter 6, verse 69, we read this. We have believed and have come to know that you are, and he's speaking to Jesus, the holy one of God. Also, it's not the only place, Acts 4.27, we see this... Uh, Let's see, um, this, this is during a, a sermon that I want to say Peter is preaching. Peter and John answered and said to them, Peter and John both are preaching. Um, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. Jesus is the holy one of God. So Jesus is the chosen one, Jesus is the holy one, and then probably the best known, Jesus is also my beloved son or beloved son, God the Father calls out at Jesus' baptism. Jesus is the chosen one, he's the holy one, and he's the beloved one. Those same exact titles that Paul gives to you, to you and to me over here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. For you have been a chosen, chosen of God, holy and beloved. Let me come back here. So Jesus is given all these titles. But because Jesus is given all these titles, remember what I said you know, earlier, I don't know when it was, it's been a, a couple weeks, but when we talked in the first chapter of Colossians, we talked about how, <coughs> excuse me, Yvette, hello, it's good to see you, hope you and Dan are doing well. Um, so one of the things we talked about was how what's true of Christ is true of the church, that we are united to Christ, that there's a union with Jesus that's taken place that we've been transferred out of the domain or the authority of darkness and into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. So if what's true of Jesus is true of the church, then that means if Jesus is the chosen one and the holy one and the beloved one, then the church is also the chosen one and the holy one and the beloved one. And this is why Paul is able to say, this is who we are. So when we understand that our position, that we our position is... Um, that we're the chosen people of God as Christians who are united to Jesus. We're the chosen people of God. We're the holy people of God. We're the beloved people of God. Boy, oh boy, that prepares us to live in a particular kind of way. When I really understand what my position is and where I stand and who I am and whose I am, it prepares me to live in a particular kind of way, in the same way that understanding a job description, and don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying Christianity is a job or that we have a job description, but when we understand what our position is with reference to a job, maybe, it helps us to understand how we should act and how we should dress and what we should look like and how we should speak and on and on and on. Knowing the position helps us understand everything that comes out of that. And it's the same way with our faith. When we understand that we are chosen of God and holy of God, um, being made holy by God and beloved of God, it, it, it makes all these other things sort of flow out of that. So what is it that Paul then tells us we should be doing? Well, he says... You need to first put on a heart of compassion. I love this phrase, a heart of compassion. If you look here and we look up the word heart, it is, let me see if I can, if I can look it up right here in a, in a good, right here. It originally denotes the inward parts of a sacrifice, including the heart, liver, lungs, and kidneys. This is, I, I think in the King James it says bowels is the word that it uses here. Um, Paul is saying to have a heart, a, 
of compassion, to let within yourself feel compassion for other people, um, that you should be able and should, should recognize what other people are going through. You should have a deep sensitivity, um, N.T. Wright says, this is the way he defines it, a deep sensitivity to the needs of of others. This is what it means to have a heart of compassion. That when I see others, my initial thought is, what are they trying to get out of me? That's not what it is. Instead, what it is, is, oh, I, I feel for them and I want to see them helped. I want to see them experience wholeness and healing and peace and all the things that God wants. So what Paul wants us to do is to put on a heart of compassion. And again, remember what we said here, this whole idea of a heart of compassion is, um, or, or, or of putting on, rather. Sorry, I'm trying. I'm making a moving my uh, windows around here. Um, the whole idea of putting on, uh, putting on. This is clothing language. Remember, I said that yesterday. So Paul is saying you're, you've taken off certain clothes and now you're putting on new clothes. And part of these new clothes involve that you have this heart of compassion. You look at other people and you don't. You look at them with sympathy rather than you know looking down on them or. Um, out of anger or wrath or anything else. So that's where we begin. And then he says you need to also put on kindness. Now, kindness is just having the, the proper, correct attitude toward others. Um, a Christ-like attitude, we might call it. This is treating other people well. I mean, it's really kind of a simple word. This is just practicing the golden rule. Right? That you treat others the way you would want to be treated. That's what it means to be kind. So you're not doing things uh, to people that you wouldn't want people to do to you. And in fact, you go a step further than that. You're actually doing things for other people that you wish people would do for you. Um, that is what it means to be kind. So we have a right attitude toward others. And then he gives us the word humility, which is so important. And that's having a right attitude about ourself. Humility is really sort of the foundation for, or it's, a, it's a big part of the foundation for the Christian life. It's where we begin. If we don't have humility, we won't get anywhere in the Christian life because we'll never recognize that we have a need for God, that we need forgiveness, that we've done anything wrong, that we've ever sinned, that there's any authority above me. None of those things are, are become realized for us until we experience humility, until we're willing to say, I'm not the one who the world revolves around. So, humility is sort of the foundation of the Christian life. I posted something on Facebook earlier today. Well, not earlier. Well, yeah, I guess it was earlier today. It was last night right before I went to bed at 4.30 in the morning. And um, I was doing some, some studying on Ephesians uh, because I'm in a class right now on Ephesians. And there's this passage in Ephesians where Paul talks about... Well, you know what? I can just bring us over there, can't I? In Ephesians 4, the very first few verses, Paul is talking about the unity of God's people... And he says that we should walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, Paul, uh, you know, is this is a mirror, a mirror image, these verses, of what we find over here in Colossians chapter 3. And what Paul, the sort of progression he gives us here is that we start with humility, and as we learn humility, as we recognize who we really are, we have a, a right um, understanding of who we are, it leads us to be gentle with people. And as we're gentle with people, we grow in patience and tolerance. And as we grow in patience and tolerance, we actually start to love one another. Um, and as we love one another, it creates a desire within us to be united. You know, if I don't love somebody, it's going to be hard for me to really desire unity with them. But the more I love somebody, the more there's going to be a natural desire within me to, to want to cultivate and find unity. And I think that's what Paul's saying right here in Ephesians 4. And it's also what he's saying right here in Colossians chapter 3. So Paul tells us, that we need to have that humility. We also, he says, need to have gentleness. Now, gentleness is one of the same words he uses over there in uh, Ephesians 4. One of the definitions of gentleness that I came across yesterday as I was uh, preparing for yesterday's lesson was that gentleness is knowing exactly when to get angry. That you don't get angry when you don't need to, and you don't get angry, or you, and you get angry when you do need to, but you don't get angry when you don't need to. Kind of like Jesus. You know, Jesus was not somebody who went around and was angry at everybody. There's some people who, they just seem like they're always mad about something. They've always got some kind of fight uh, to get into. And what, G, uh, what Paul says is that we need to instead just get mad when we're, we should, 
when injustice is taking place, maybe that's a good time to get angry, kind of like Jesus did with the uh, the money changers in the temple. When there's been an injustice, when God's name has just been run through the mud, maybe that's a time to get angry. But when somebody has offended you or upset you, um, that's not a time to get angry. <laughs> it might might be a time when we feel anger, when we want to get angry, uh, but it's not a time to act out of anger. Instead, we ought to practice gentleness, which is this sort of median, uh, this middle road between uh, where we treat other people with a genuine um, humility in, in mind. And we're not rude. We're not arrogant. That, that, I think, is one of the biggest things that we as Christians need to work on, is not being rude or arrogant, because we have a tendency to do that without even thinking about it. The last thing he says, or one other thing he says, the last thing in this verse, is that we need to have patience. When we approach people and we deal with people, with their actions and with their reactions, and we do it with humility, it helps us to be patient. In other words, we're not resentful. We don't become angry or um, upset. We don't yell at people. Instead, we, we learn to just, well, we learn to do what Paul says next, which is bear with one another. That we bear with one another. Let me tell you a, a story. Um, I had somebody come to me once. There was a, a mutual friend of ours. And this mutual friend had some idiosyncrasies. They had some things about them that some people might say, might call odd or different. Put it that way. Um, well, I, you know, this is somebody that I was, you know, good friends with and that I loved and appreciated. And, and just like I know there, I have idiosyncrasies, I understood that they had idiosyncrasies. So anytime I dealt with this person, I dealt with them with those idiosyncrasies in mind. Because I knew that if I went to them and, and talked to them or had a conversation with them or tried to interact with them in any way, and I tried to, to do that without those idiosyncrasies in mind, that it would frustrate me. Because I would think, well, why don't they do this? Or why do they say this? Or why do they act this way? But when I approach them and I deal with them knowing this is the way they're going to act because this is who they are. And it's not that what they're doing is sinful or wrong. It's just one of those idiosyncrasies. It's one of those little oddities about human life and human people. And we're all different. We all got our own kind of ways of doing things. And so when I would approach them, I would go with the understanding that this is what they're going to do. This is what they're going to say. This is the way they're going to act. And then when they acted that way, I wasn't surprised. And so I was able to, to deal with them in a way that a lot of other people couldn't deal with them. Why? Because I expected it. So it didn't surprise me, it didn't get me flustered, it didn't get me frustrated, because I knew that was the way it was going to be. And I approached them with that understanding, and it made the whole experience a whole lot more pleasant. And I was able to be at peace, and to cultivate peace between us, and able to be friends with them, I mean, deep friends with them. Why? Because I wasn't expecting them to be something that they weren't. That's what bearing with one another is. It is letting people be themselves. Letting people be odd. Letting people be different. Understanding that and not demanding that everybody act just like me and, and, and be just like me and talk just like me and never make a decision that's different than mine. Um, and again, I'm not talking about sin, but I'm talking about just peculiarities that people have. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I know I've got them. I know people have to bear with, my wife has to bear with me all the time. Anybody who knows me has to bear with me, especially anytime we go to a bookstore. There's a lot of bearing that is required when I go into a bookstore. In fact, I, I was dating this girl one time, kind of getting off the rails now, um, but I was dating this girl one time and uh, it, it was one of the first times that we had gone out. And I remember going to the bookstore with her and afterwards when we broke up, that was one of the things she told me was she just could not handle the way that I acted in a bookstore. <laughs> Because, you know, I, it was like being a kid in a candy store. I'm going from section to section and I'm looking and I'm enthralled and I'm, you know, I, I mean, I could spend hours there. I know that's just how I am. Um, so, you know, if you ever walk into a bookstore with me, you just got to, you got to bear with me. And that's what, that's what Paul encourages us to do. If we will bear with one another and sort of recognize those little oddities and not expect people to not be what they naturally are, um, it will, it will help us have peace with one another. Trust me, it will. <laughs> it's one of the ways, one of the reasons that I'm able to get along with a lot of different people because, you know, it's just, you just got to recognize, got to recognize and not worry about it. So what's this, the, the next thing Paul tells us? That we forgive each other whoever has a complaint against anyone. This is a really, really important one, and it's probably one of the most difficult. Maybe that's why Paul has it towards the end. I, I feel like a lot of times when Paul goes through lists like this, he sort of builds one on top of one another until he gets to the very end. 
Um, and so it's like you start with kindness, get some humility, get some gentleness, patience, bear with one another, forgive one another. Then that, that, that takes it a step beyond bearing one, with one another. Because bearing with one another just requires me to sort of preemptively look at people and, and when I'm dealing with people, recognize this is the way that they are and I'm not going to worry about it. And so if they say something that, you know, would maybe from another person would get me upset, I'm not going to get upset because I know this is how they are. Forgiving one another is when somebody hurts you, maybe when they act out of character and, or, or when they act in an unexpected way and they do something um, to hurt you or maybe they don't even mean to hurt you, but it hurts you anyway. He says that we need to be willing to forgive each other. And this is a really important one. I mean, this is key. This is something Jesus told parables about, right? You think of the parable of the unforgiving servant where he, uh, he shares about a man who was forgiven this tremendous sum of money and he gets out of jail and he goes and he finds the guy that owes him five bucks and, and wrings his neck and throws him in prison and says, you're not getting out until you pay me everything you owe me. And Jesus says, you know, when the, the master, when the person who forgave that guy this huge sum of money, um, finds that out, he's going to get him and he's going he's to put him back in jail and force him to do the same thing he's doing. Forgiveness is such an important thing. We even find it in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus talks about prayer, right? One of the, the petitions of the Lord's Prayer is forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us or as we forgive our debtors. So right there in the Sermon on the Mount, we have this, the importance of forgiving each other. And if we are going to experience Christian unity, if we're going to love one another, if we're going to be a part of the church in the way that God wants, the only way that's going to happen is if we actively practice forgiveness. Because the reality is we got a lot of people in the church, and anytime you get a lot of people together, you're going to have issues, you're going to have problems, you're going to have disagreements, you're going to have people who do and say things that other people don't like, and they get upset and angry. And... <laughs> people when they're together are like a time bomb waiting to go off. Um, it's just the way that it is. And that's why the church is this place where we should be able to come and practice forgiveness. This is why one of the ways that I have described the church is a laboratory of love. <laughs> I've described the church that way because it is in the church that we learn how to love one another rightly. We, it's in the church that we should be learning how to forgive one another. It's in the church that we learn what it is to do unto others what you would have others do unto you. If I can't love and forgive the person sitting next to me in the chair or pew, um, there's no way I'm going to be able to forgive the person that's out, you know, in the world, out at my job, out uh, with my family, you know. There's no way, you know, with unbelieving family members, there's no way that I'm going to be able to practice love with them if I don't learn it first within the church. This is why the church is this laboratory of love where we learn how to forgive one another. Um, and, and, and let's be honest, sometimes we need to ask forgiveness. Today, I had to ask forgiveness from somebody because I said something in a way that I shouldn't have. And we need to just be willing Whenever we recognize, when somebody comes to us and says, and, and, and there's a, been a complaint, um, we need to be willing to, to admit our fault, to admit what we've done, and to say, you know what, I, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that, maybe I, I shouldn't have said that that way, maybe even just, I'm sorry that I hurt you, um, but we need to be willing to forgive one another, because that's at the core of what it means to be Christian. Now, forgiving one another does not necessarily mean that we... Uh, that everything goes back to the way that it used to be. Um, and, 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 and I say that, I think it's important to say that, because sometimes if somebody has, has a, a pattern of hurting people again and again and again and again, and they've hurt me, yes, I can forgive them, but it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to put myself in the exact same situation that I was before and going to be hurt again and again and again and again. There comes a time at which I think it makes sense to sort of to forgive and to step away from the relationship or from the from that person and from what they're doing because what they're doing is destructive and it's going to end up pulling me into um, their destruction and sort of this destructive pattern that goes further and further. So forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean that everything goes back to the way that it was. And I think this is something that's important for us to realize as Christians because there's been times in the past, maybe, when somebody, a Christian, has told you that if you've forgiven somebody, then that means the relationship is automatically restored. And there's only so much we can do. There's only so much we can do. We can love somebody without having to be in the same room with them 24 hours a day. 
Uh, and sometimes the best thing for everyone's sake is to separate myself physically from a person um, if they have consistently hurt me. This is, this is really important. I, I want to tie this last part into this. Paul says that we should forgive each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Again, this is something Jesus taught. It's there in the Lord's Prayer. I want to read to you a quote from N.T. Wright uh, on this whole topic. He says, first, it is utterly inappropriate for one who knows the joy and release of being forgiven to refuse to share that blessing with another. Second, it is highly presumptuous to refuse to forgive one whom Christ himself has already forgiven. I, I mean, I obviously can't say it any better than that. Um, that is what it comes down to. Uh, if Christ is forgiven, then we have no reason not to forgive even though that doesn't mean that we have to, everything goes back to the way that it was. Um, hopefully that makes enough sense and, and we got that part. So let's keep going. Uh, and it looks like we're going to go a little bit longer tonight. Dan, I'm glad that you've uh, joined us. And John, it's good to see you. All right, so let us uh, look at this next part. He says, beyond all these things, or this word can also be on top of all these things, on all these things, um, put on love which is the perfect bond of unity. Uh, in other words, what Paul is saying is that love is sort of the clasp that holds all of this together. So if you can imagine all of these things as clothing, right? I've got my heart of compassion belt, and I've got my kindness jacket, and I've got my humility underwear, <laughs> um, and I've got my gentleness socks, and, and my patience pants, and everything. He says, and then you want to take love, and love is sort of what is going to hold all these things together. Love is the thing that that um, that that not only holds all of these virtues together, because without love, none of these other things are going to work. You try and have compassion or kindness or humility or gentleness or patience or try to bear with somebody or forgive somebody without love, and it's going to be nearly impossible. Love is the thing that binds it all together, that holds it together. Love is the glue. But love is also the glue that holds us together as the church. It binds us together in unity. And this is what Paul is going to say right here in this next part. He's sort of transitioning now into how we should interact with one another as a church, as a, as a body, a corporate body of believers. So these are all very um, sort of almost individualistic. This is the way that each one of us should be acting. And now he's going to get into, all right, so now what's it going to look like for all of you when you gather as, a, as the people of God? He says, first of all, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. Notice he brings out that you were called in one body. When we hear the peace of Christ, we would probably, it would be easy for us to think individualistically. In other words, um, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, in other words, we're thinking of, well, God has given me this peace that passes all understanding. And that is a part. I mean, that's something, but it's not... I don't think what really what Paul has in mind here. What he has in mind is a peace in our hearts that is ruling. He uses that word rule, let it rule over you. Um, I, at least I think that's what he uses in, yeah, this word here. can mean to be an umpire or a judge. He says, let this peace of Christ rule in your hearts, hearts, in all of your hearts together as you're called in one body. Paul's talking about unity here, and he's talking not necessarily about the peace of mind that I have by knowing I'm saved, or the peace of mind I know uh, when somebody passes away and I have confidence that you know they're with Christ. That's not really the peace Paul's dealing with here. The peace Paul's dealing with here is peace between believers. It's the peace that holds us together in one body. That's the peace Paul has in mind here. And he's saying, you need to let this peace of Christ, you need to let Christ rule over your church body. And for his peace to uh, to make it so that y'all get along, and and boy oh boy, if 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 we need any you know message, if we need anything in the world we live in today, a world that's so polarized and so divided, and and where we all think we all sort of take sides and run to those sides, and then lodge you know verbal missiles or otherwise over at the other side, what we need is that focus on the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. 
so that we can truly be the one body of Christ, not divided by anything, not divided by denomination, not divided by, um, you know, insignificant doctrines, not, not divided by, you know, the secondary and tertiary kind of doctrines, not divided by worship style, not divided by translation of Bible, not divided by nation, not divided by ethnic group, not divided by anything, but instead that we are the one body of Christ. That's so, so, so important. It's something we need to recognize. And then Paul says, and be thankful. You know, uh, love and peace and thanksgiving have this way of mutually reinforcing one another. When we truly love somebody, it causes us to desire peace with them and then to seek peace, right? I mean, we don't like being at war with people that we genuinely love. Even people who love drama and conflict don't like whenever it takes place with somebody they genuinely love. I hope not. Um, with somebody we love, we want to have peace. We want our relationship to be calm and to be peaceful. And as we experience that peace, it makes us more thankful. As we, When we have peace with somebody, it helps us to appreciate them more and to be thankful for them and for all they have to offer and who they are and, and, and just everything about them. And that thanksgiving then leads us to love them more, which leads us to seek peace more, which leads us to give thanks more. These are mutually reinforcing things. And I think this is what Paul is getting at here, that we will experience some real thanks as we practice these things. Let me erase all of my scribbles. So, that is, I think, what Paul's getting at here. Now we come to these last two verses. Paul says, first of all, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Um, in other words, the gospel. And I think that this would include a couple of things. It would include the literal books of the Bible. But it would also include preaching and teaching. And I think it would also include... Um, the the we might call it the witness of the spirit in other words there's times when when god through his holy spirit gives us an impression or, or speaks to us in a very uh, personal way lets us know something um gives us a direction maybe reveals a sin you know or or some some area of of weakness that we need to work on all of these things it, are included in that that word of christ um, and what Paul is saying is that we need to allow the, that, that word of Christ to richly dwell within us. R remember, I, I mentioned a, several weeks ago this dwell language that he talks about, let it live in you. We, Jesus uses the same kind of language over in John 15 when he says that to let, let, you know, um, let my words abide in you or live in you or dwell in you. And so what Paul's encouraging us to is to really focus on the scriptures, on the gospel, on the books of the Bible, on the preaching and teaching of God's word, on the witness of the spirit, what God has, has spoken to me, that I let that richly dwell within me, that I'm thinking about it, I'm contemplating it. Um, I love that word, richly. Man, are, are we allowing God's word to richly dwell within us? Or is it just something, is it more like a visitor that uh, you know drops by the house on occasion? Um, when I hear that phrase, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, I just, I imagine, um, I almost imagine that show Hoarders, which maybe you've seen, or maybe if you're fortunate, you haven't seen, but you know, some, there's been episodes where people walk into the house and there's just garbage everywhere. I mean, to the point where when you walk in, there's just a small path that you have to just sort of follow in order to get wherever you need to go. And they've got this path carved out. Now, obviously, that's garbage, but I'm imagining something like that, only instead of garbage, it's treasure. And it's like my house is so filled with treasure, with gold and, and, and all of this with this treasure that, you know, I, I've, I've just got so much. I have to carve a path through it all. That's the picture I get as I hear, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. I imagine a life that is so full of God's word and of his, his message to us that it's like I just have to carve a path through it in order to talk or think about anything else because it is so prevalent in my life and in my thinking that the scriptures sort of come out naturally. It's one of the things that I've noticed about John Wesley's sermons. It's one of the reasons I love John Wesley. But when you read his sermons, 
even the areas where he's preaching and he's not quoting scripture, half of it sounds like scripture because his his mind was so engaged with God's word, it was it was richly dwelling in him. And because of that, it came out naturally. And I think that's the the uh, the great thing about allowing God's word to richly dwell within us. Then he mentions that we should do this with all wisdom and teaching, or wisdom teaching and admonishing one another. In other words, this is sort of pointing to that preaching and teaching element. Um, so how are we allowing it to dwell within us? Well, first of all, we're allowing it to dwell within us through the wisdom and through the teaching. And then he says this. Now, this is where there may be some, I don't know, some debate. He says, with hymns and spiritual songs and singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Uh, in Greek, there is no word with. Instead, the words psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are in a form that can mean that uh, mean with, with these things. But remember, in, in Greek, um, you don't have punctuation, so we don't really know how all of this is supposed to be punctuated. This, these three words could technically go with singing, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, um, not necessarily with uh, this teaching part. And so, yes, whereas songs and, and, you know, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, they can be absolutely um, elements or, or tools of teaching. And I think a lot of them are. I mean, uh, I've heard it said before that the most important theologian in your church is not the pastor, but he's the person who picks the music. Because when you leave church, you don't go out singing the words of the sermon. You go out singing the words that you've just sung. Uh, and so, yes, the songs that we sing, the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, they absolutely do teach, but I don't know that that is necessarily their primary purpose. I think their primary purpose actually may be over here. Um, they're a means of letting Christ's word dwell within us. And so you might add to this, oh, you might add to this songs. I don't know why my, my oh, there it is. Um, you might add to this songs. And notice, he gives us three kinds. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. I think there's a number of people who have made distinctions between these, tried to tease out exactly what they are, and some have said psalms are songs that are accompanied with an instrument and hymns are not. They're a cappella. Some have said psalms are using the Old Testament book of psalms, the Psalter, and singing those, and then hymns are something different. Uh, I, I, I don't know that there are, is really a hard and fast difference between these three. I don't know that it's like, you know, today we might say hymns and praise songs and specials or something. I don't know that there's quite that, that kind of a clear distinction that would be equivalent to whatever we're thinking of or experiencing. Instead, what I think Paul is getting at is that the music that we sing and that we worship together with... Um, <laughs> yeah, Ben, you did. Uh, we're almost through. That when you look at these three things, these are all, it, that we find a diversity. That's really the point of this. That there is a diversity of worship music that is at play. And Paul's encouraging what he says is not only use X, only use Y, only use Z. What he's saying is, Enjoy the diversity of gifts that God has given us. Enjoy the diversity of music and songs that are available to us. And um, don't think that you can only or you only have the ability to worship and to let the word of Christ dwell within you through one particular avenue. God is bigger than those things. God encompasses those things. And when somebody's heart is right before him, he does not care whether they're using a song that was written today or a song that was written 150 years ago or a song that was written 1700 years ago. Um, there's a diversity. Enjoy the diversity. This is something that I, I think Paul's an advocate for. And he says that we need to sing with thankfulness in our, in our hearts. Remember, he's already said be thankful before. He brings it up again. Why? I think Thanksgiving is sort of the fruit of the Christian life. Uh, that's sort of, you know, towards the end, we're going to be thankful people. At the end of the day, when we've lived a holy life, when we've lived a chosen and beloved life, when we have loved people, when we've been humble, when we've done all these things, at the end of the day, when everybody else is gone and we're laying down to go to sleep, I think the primary um, attitude that we're going to have is thankfulness and thanksgiving. Because we're going to recognize all that God's done, who he is, um, his faithfulness. And we're going to be able to recognize that even when maybe we were put in circumstances we didn't want to be in, even when people were not very kind, that we did what we were supposed to. And there is a kind of thanksgiving that comes along with just knowing that 
I've done what I'm supposed to do, and I don't have anything hanging over my head. Uh, that is sort of the end result, the last thing that we have to, 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 thank, to, um, to offer uh, before we close our eyes and sleep. Finally, Paul sums it all up with this beautiful phrase, whatever you do in word or deed, in other words, everything, um, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. When he says name, there's two issues, two ideas that are at work here. We're almost done. Number one, you're representing that person. In other words, if you can't do it as a representative of Jesus, you shouldn't do it. This is what Paul says. That everything we do, whether it's a word that we speak, whether it's an action that we take, that everything should be done representing Jesus. And so if I think, well, um, if I think about my actions or my words and I, and I ask myself the question, can I rightly represent Jesus and say this? And the answer is no. Paul would say, don't say it. If I say, if I ask myself, can I do this, whatever it happens to be, and rightly represent Jesus, and the answer is no, then I think Paul would say, don't do it. That would go a long way towards helping us make decisions about those conviction issues that we find in our lives, is to ask ourselves that, can I rightly represent Jesus? Will Jesus be represented well in this action or in this word? And if, if the answer is no, then we shouldn't do it. And if we do it, and then afterwards we realize we shouldn't have done it, the best thing we can do is to go and to ask forgiveness and to apologize. Now, we don't just have representing. That's not just what the name's about. Um, but also when we act on behalf of the name of someone, there's the representation aspect and there's also an empowered aspect. Uh, when you went out, when somebody, uh, a, an ambassador, for example, would go out representing a nation, um, he wouldn't just go, or in the name of a nation, he wouldn't just go as a representative, though he would, he would also go empowered by that nation. He would have the authority of that nation. And so if a, a diplomat or an ambassador goes to another nation and, and discusses issues with him, at the end of the day, he he has authority to to do some things, you know, to commit his nation to some things. Um, he is empowered up to a point. Now, he may not have the same authority or power that a, a president has or a prime minister has or a king has, but he's got authority behind it. And Paul's saying the same thing about us, that when we do what the things we do, when we do them in the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, not just Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, you might say of King Jesus, because remember, we are representatives. We are ambassadors. When we go out and we act as representatives of King Jesus in his name, we're not only representing him, but we are empowered by him. And so he is the one that will help us live this kind of way. He's the one who has made us chosen and holy and beloved. And he's the one that will empower through his Holy Spirit us to do these things. So when we look at these things like compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another and forgiving one another, when we look at these things and we think, man, oh man, oh man, I am just not the forgiving kind. I am just not the bearing kind. I'm just not the humble kind. Kind of like Mac, Mac Davis. Is he the one that wrote that song? Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. If, you, if you're Mac Davis and you're thinking, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. If you're singing that and you think, I just, I can't do that. You're right. You can't do that. Fortunately, when you go out in the name of the Lord Jesus, he empowers you through his Holy Spirit so that you can do it. Or rather, not you, but he can do it through you. That is the power of doing things in the name of the Lord Jesus. And notice how Paul ends this section, and this is where we'll close. Notice how he ends it. Giving, oh, there it is again. What is up with this? Okay. Giving thanks through him to God the Father. Where does Paul return? The same place he was here, the same place he was here. Both of these things return to giving thanks. Why? Well, because um, at the end of the day, when we live this way, when we allow King Jesus to empower us, when we allow ourselves to be his representative, there is a sense of thanksgiving and peace that accompanies that, that is unlike anything else. When I, you know, if, if even if I've had a terrible day, if I know that I've done what God has called me to do, 
If I know that I've followed him, if I know that I've allowed him to work through me at the end of the day, even if everybody else has treated me like utter garbage, I can lay down in bed with a thankful heart because I know I've done what I'm supposed to do. I'll be honest with you. We close. I'll close with this. I know I probably already said that. I sound like a preacher, don't I? Um, when I first started preaching... Uh, there was this tendency for me to, you know, after the sermon, you sort of have all these thoughts about, well, I should have said this, or I shouldn't have said this, or, you know, I, I, I wish I would have said this over here, or I wish I would have made this point, or used this illustration, or whatever. And it's so easy to get caught up in that after you finish preaching. I think it's the same as true as after, you know, after you're teaching, or really anything like that. Um, even getting into some conversations, you may feel that way. But here's what God began to speak to me as I felt that way, is... I would, I would finish preaching and I would go and I would pray and um, I would have all these thoughts. God, I'm, you know, I should have said this and I should have said that. Should have, shouldn't have said this. And he would ask me the question, Casey, did you do the best that you could? And I'd say, well, I tried. And he'd say, did you say what I asked you to say? And I'd say, well, yeah, I, I mean, I tried. I tried to, you know, explain the scriptures just like, like, like I think you want. And he'd say, that's all I'm asking for. And there's a sense of peace and of thanksgiving when you have done what you know to do, when you've done the best you can, and when you can say, I've done all I know to do, I've done the best I can, I put everything else in the hands of God, and I'm just going to be thankful that he is faithful and that he is good and that he loves me enough to use me in whatever small capacity that he may use me. That's enough for me. And I can sleep well at night knowing that. That is where I think Christ wants us to be. And um, that's where I'm seeking to go. And I hope that that is where all of you are seeking to go. I'm so thankful that you joined me tonight. Because like I said, this is just a powerful, powerful passage. And um I'm, I, it's been really encouraging. So we got about three more lessons in the book of Colossians. Uh, it looks like we've got this one on family relations, which we'll do um, tomorrow night. And then we've got two here in chapter four. Um, one that goes from verse one through six, and then one from seven to the end. Just so you know, for this night, for this week, we will have our Colossians study tomorrow night at six. On Wednesday, we will have our Theology for Dummies class at 7 o'clock. We'll be talking about the New Testament and why we can trust the New Testament. On Thursday and Friday, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, Because it's Maundy Thursday and because it's Good Friday, we're actually going to talk about those things. Um, So I will still invite you to join me at 6 o'clock. We'll be discussing Maundy Thursday, the Lord's Supper, and feet washing um, on Thursday night and then on Friday night. And I, I, you know, we, we really have the possibility on Thursday night to have a better attendance at our Monday Thursday online service than I've ever seen at an actual Monday Thursday service. So I'm kind of excited about that. And then uh, on Friday, we'll have kind of a Good Friday um, lesson and, and discussion. Uh, and then we won't have anything on, on Saturday. So that's our schedule for this week, since this is Holy Week. I want to encourage you to seek the Lord this week. Let this be an opportunity for us to really cut through all the noise, spend some time with God, get alone with Him, get quiet with Him, listen for His voice, dig into the Word. Um, let's draw near to Him as we prepare for this very unconventional Easter that we have in front of us. I love you, and I appreciate you. Like I said before, if you have any questions or other thoughts, please throw them in the comments. And if you wouldn't mind sharing and liking, it would certainly um, be an encouragement. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night.